starts right now. A big explosion, multiple deaths, and neighbors unable to get back into their homes for days. New details are emerging despite a slow-moving investigation into this deadly explosion. The Bear County Examiner is releasing the identity of another victim in this case. It's identified 28-year-old Ashley Autoby and 36-year-old Roger Huron Jr. as victims in Friday's deadly explosion. Now, we're still waiting on names for two more victims, but we know that they're a 57-year-old man and a 61-year-old man. That blast happened around 1130 Friday night near a construction company on South Presa near Loop 4. The night team's Alyssa Cole joins us near the scene. Alyssa, investigators were out there again today, but their work seems far from over. Yes, Steve, Stephanie, if San Antonio firefighters say the weather hampered their efforts into that investigation of the explosion, and that means this property is closed even for the people who live here. My RV is there, my animals are back there. I I need to get on there. Nearly 72 hours after a deadly explosion, a woman who lives on the same property but did not want to go on camera says she is still waiting for access to her home. But it's not doing me no good to be out here and not really having a place to stay, to sleep. You can't take a bath. You can't change my clothes. My shoes were wet for two days because I didn't have extra shoes. And I have all my stuff in my RV, but they just won't let me get it. The woman says she was turned away twice by police. She says they're waiting for fire investigators to figure out what caused the explosion. Until then, she has no idea what condition her home is in. The only thing they said is that, I'm, is that I might not be able to live in the RV when I first when I first come back. That's all they said. And I said, was well, it damaged? And they said they couldn't tell me. The only thing she can do is wait. I'm outside on the street until then. Yes, Steve, Stephania, there is some good news. The ASPCA, they were able to get the woman's pets. And of course, we asked police, when will she be able to get back in her home? We still haven't gotten a clear answer to that. But we do know that San Antonio firefighters will be holding a press conference tomorrow discussing the details of this investigation up until this point. Again, that's happening tomorrow at the public safety headquarters. Alyssa Cole, Case at 12 News. So much still unknown. Thank you, Alyssa. Another big story tonight, the weather. A live look outside at this hour, a cold front set to arrive tomorrow. We've known about this. It's yeah. expected to come in. It's expected to set us up for some changes later on in the week. Let's bring in our friend and meteorologist, Adam Kasky. So, Adam, when exactly should we expect those temperatures to drop? Well, that's actually a great question because you're not going to feel it immediately tomorrow, but by Wednesday, you'll notice the big changes. Let's look, look at the temperatures right now across the state, mostly 60s and 70s, but our cold front is just moving into West Texas and the Panhandle right now. Behind it, we've got temperatures in the 30s and even some 20s. Now it's not going to get that cold around here, but you will notice that drop by, as I mentioned, Wednesday. Tomorrow morning, about 67, 68 around San Antonio. Woo! <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes these cameras get a little mind. It's, li it's live TV, baby. <laughs> I was going to try to run with it, but I don't think I'd be able to keep up. Anyway, look at the temperature drop. These are just morning lows. Look at how we drop off. By Wednesday morning, you'll want your jacket at 50 degrees. Thursday, Friday, 39 to start the day. We'll talk about how the high temperatures change, rain chances, and what you will feel immediately tomorrow along that front coming up. Steve? Thank you, Adam. Conservative staying warm being seen out in the border city of El Paso, where asylum seekers are actually starting fires, and many of them appear to be right along the banks of the Rio Grande. Hundreds of migrants, thousands arrived at the border overnight, and more expected ahead of the possible end of Title 42 next week. The Trump era policy allows for the immediate expulsion of migrants without allowing them to seek asylum. That is going away. Border Patrol in El Paso says they are at capacity. Unauthorized crossings there now average more than 2,400 arrests and detainments per day. Now, new tonight, an inmate tries to break free during a hospital visit. Investigators say the inmate is now dead after shots were fired in the emergency room. This happened at Seton Hospital in Kyle just this afternoon. Investigators say the inmate hit a Hayes County corrections officer as he ran through the emergency room. And that's when police say the corrections officer then fired his gun and hit the inmate. 
The hospital says that hosp uh, medical staff tried to save him, but he died from his injuries. At this point, we don't know his name. The Texas Rangers are now helping in the investigation. And by the way, that inmate faced several charges, including reckless driving. More fallout and frustration in Uvalde today and tonight. Victims' families directing their anger at former acting city police chief Mariano Pargas. He currently serves as a county commissioner and was flanked by law enforcement as he left a county commissioner's meeting today. A barrier of protection for Pargas as members of the community and family members argued that their children were not protected the day of the shooting at Robb Elementary. You can't step down. Why are you protecting Excuse them? I hope you come them every day. Every, every day. You, you see them how they were in there. How come you guys didn't do that at the school? We asked Pargus what he had to say to survivors and victims' families. All I can say is that a lot of stuff been put out there. It's not the way it happened. That's all I can tell you. That was the first time Pargas spoke since a report that he knew kids inside the Rob Elementary classrooms were calling 911, desperate for help during that shooting. You heard parents there yelling at him. Parents in Uvalde were also very upset after they saw the results of an independent review of a different law enforcement agency. Uvalde County Commissioners discussed the Uvalde County Sheriff's Office and its policy and procedures the day of the mass shooting at Robb Elementary. You are correct, Commissioner. In regards to there was no active shooter policy, there were only definitions. Uh, that was Richard Carter, who you just heard. He reviewed the procedures, but he made it clear that this was not an investigation into the sheriff's office and its response that day. Carter also says that Sheriff Ruben Nolasco has not gotten active shooter training since the day of the shooter, but does plan to in the near future. New on the night beat, a man says he saw a laser. The next thing he heard were gunshots. It happened on San Judas Street, not far from General McMullen and West Commerce. The victim told police he happened to cross paths with someone he's had issues with in the past. Officers say they exchanged words before the victim saw a laser pointed at him. The 42 year old victim shot in the leg, taken to the hospital, the suspect detained. Officers are now trying to find the weapon in this case. Students and staff across three local high schools are now being tested for tuberculosis. Those being tested considered close contacts of a single case reported at Brandeis High School. Metro Health says it expects to screen about 115 people total at Brandeis, Clark and O'Connor High Schools. The Northside Independent School District notified families last week about the case at Brandeis and a common link to Clark and O'Connor. Those considered close contacts were also notified by Metro Health. There's no need to panic or worry at this point. There's no, there won't be any further transmission at this point. Metro Health says the patient who tested positive was isolated and that person is in stable condition. Now for a look at some of today's big headlines in your night beat news flash. A man's body found in a ditch on the southwest part of the county. And now Bear County deputies want to know how it ended up there. Now someone passing by found that body off of Quintana Road near Kinney Road. That was around nine this morning. We don't know the person's name. The victim is only being described as an African-American man in his early 30s. Smoke, flames, and flashing lights really scared people in one neighborhood. Firefighters responded to a fire that sparked up in someone's garage. Happened just after 6 this evening on Anton Drive, which is on the southeast side. Firefighters say that everyone inside, along with their pets, made it out alive. No one was injured. And San Antonio police now responding to a viral post that you or your family may have seen on their social media feed. This post claims that there's a serial killer in our area. Well, San Antonio police say the post has, quote, no factual basis, end quote. We first shared the police Dep department's response on KSAT.com. SAPD said that it's aware of the posts and wanted to reassure the public not to be alarmed. They call the posts unsubstantiated. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. You still ahead on the Nightbeat basketball star Brittany Griner continuing her treatment right here in Military City, USA. What today's workout included and the new images released moments after her release from a Russian penal colony. And a familiar face returns. Interim District 10 Councilman Mike Gallagher taking the reins as Clayton Perry deals with his legal issues. The conversation Gallagher says he had with the Councilman coming up.
Plus, a hearing delayed for Councilman Clayton Perry. Now, we look at what led up to today's hearing and also what's expected next in the hit and run crash against him. It's after the break. A delay in the court case against San Antonio Councilman Clayton Perry. The Northside Councilman was originally scheduled to be arraigned today on the hit and run crash that he admitted he was involved in, specifically on the charge of failing to stop and give information. His court appearance has been reset for January 24th. That would be more than two months since the crash on November 6th. Body camera videos showed a police officer found Councilman Perry laying in his backyard and his Jeep still running in the driveway. Perry claimed he wasn't the driver. Eight days later, a majority of city council members passed a no confidence vote in Perry. However, they scrapped a call for him to resign and instead acknowledged his plan to take a leave of absence. And then on December 1st, Mike Gallagher was appointed to temporarily fill the District 10 seat. Then on December 6th, San Antonio police filed a DWI case against Perry. But prosecutors haven't announced whether or not they're going to move forward with it. The court indicated that that pending case was behind the delay, which the court said was requested by Perry's attorney. And if Perry winds up officially charged with DWI, it could be brought up in next month's hearing along with the charge of failure to stop and give information. And again, that hearing is on January 24th. Meanwhile, interim councilman Mike Gallagher continuing to fill in in District 10. He helped with the toy drive to help collect toys ahead of the holidays tonight. The former councilman says it's been a smooth transition to temporarily fill that seat. He also credited the support of the staff when asked, Gallagher says he has also spoken with Councilman Clayton Perry. I had the opportunity to talk to him yesterday and he was in a very good mood. Things uh, seem to be going very, very well. And let's all just hope and pray that it all comes out OK for him. Gallagher says he's encouraged Perry to return to District 10 and to the seat as soon as he's ready. In other news now, WNBA star Brittany Griner spent another day today in Military City, USA. This is just days after she was released from a Russian penal colony. Now, her workout today included some time on the court with a basketball. ABC's Justin Finch has the story. Newly released images show a smiling Brittany Griner alongside her wife, Sherelle, and top U.S. hostage negotiator, Ambassador Roger Carson, who brought her home. Griner also in high spirits in this photo shared with ABC News, taken before her flight to the U.S. Griner greeting every member of the flight crew. I watched her and she connected with everyone, looked in their eyes, shook hands, got to know their names. Griner also opening up about her time in Russian custody. We talked about a lot of things. Uh, obviously, uh, her love for Sherelle, her teammates, everything that she missed. Russian state media video capturing some of Griner's time in a Russian prison. Griner choosing to cut her long hair because conditions inside the prison were so cold, washing it left her freezing. Griner was traded for convicted Russian arms dealer Victor Boot, known as the Merchant of Death. Boot had six years left on a 25-year sentence for conspiring to arm a terrorist group to kill Americans. Griner was caught with hashish oil, which is banned in Russia, and was sentenced to nine years in prison. President Biden now facing criticism for greenlighting the deal. If you make it clear that you're willing to take a deal no matter what, you're going to get a bad deal. The White House says it had hoped to free former Marine Paul Whelan along with Griner for Boot, but the Russians refused. Whelan has been held in Russia for nearly four years on what the U.S. calls bogus espionage charges. Paul, we haven't forgotten, forgotten you. We're coming to get you. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. Take a look outside with live cam right now. 70 degrees and like we said, the next 24 to 48 hours, we're going to see some changes. Yeah, watch that temperature. This is when you need the your Therm Thursday thermometer. Yeah, and right. You just watch it, track it hour by hour. Well, and it's going to be all over the place the next few days. Now, tomorrow, you're not going to notice a big temperature change. I want to just make that clear. You're, just, you're going to wake up. You won't even need a jacket. We'll be in the upper 60s and even muggy and more fog to start the day tomorrow. Cold front arrives at noon. And you'll notice the front, but it's not going to give us a huge temperature drop immediately. That's going to come on Wednesday. The colder, colder air kind of lags behind the front a little bit. Not much of a rain chance with it. And then 
noticeably cooler the rest of the week. So let's get into the details. First, our forecast for tomorrow, 7 a.m., 67 degrees, cloudy fog, drizzle, damp, even a few sprinkles and light showers, kind of like what we're seeing out there right now. More on that in a moment. Through the noon hour, about a 20% chance. And then 77 at noon, that'll be our high temperature for the day. Then we just drop to near 70 later on in the afternoon at 9 p.m. or 63. So clearly not a huge impact to temperatures tomorrow, but you will notice that humidity falling off very abruptly by about 1 p.m. So high temperatures at noon tomorrow, 78 Stinson up to 80 Poteet Pleasanton, even near 80 Gonzales and Nixon. The cold front's going to get to the hill country a little sooner. So Bandera 73 and Comfort 71. Then you see what happens. Highs fall off Wednesday, Thursday, 67. So closer to average for this time of year, even cooler on Friday, 63. But the low point is going to be this weekend. We're talking High temperatures, afternoon highs right near 50 degrees with a slight chance of a few showers. So we feel the humidity out there. The dew points are up well into the 60s. It's going to help lead to more fog, drizzle and dampness developing overnight and affecting the morning commute. But watch as we go through time here with our future cast for the dew point. By 9, 10 a.m., the cold front's making it into the hill country and then into the afternoon. That's when we see our dew points really fall off behind that cold front. So you will notice an abrupt drop in the humidity by early tomorrow afternoon. As for rain, currently we have a few sprinkles out there, not a whole lot to really speak of, and it's even hard to detect it fully on the radar here. Just a few little little dots here and there, but a brief sprinkle, you know, can't be ruled out for the rest of the night and even to start the day tomorrow. The real action and unfortunately some severe weather potential is up in the panhandle and then stretching toward Wichita Falls up into Oklahoma as well. Big, broad storm system coming together. Big upper level low. Of course, a surface component to it as well, but you can see this huge circulation counterclockwise circulation of the clouds and precipitation. This is a big, beautiful upper level low that's going to slowly be tra tracking its way across the northern tier of the country for several more days. And remember, these upper level lows, those upper level dips in the flow have a direct impact on our temperatures around here. And with this just lingering around, we don't have an opportunity to see that warmer air surge back in place anytime soon. Rain chances, though, 20% tomorrow, then Saturday, Sunday, we're up to 30%. That's it. That's the best we can do as we look ahead. Just a few light showers, nothing uh, substantial. Those mornings are getting cool, upper 30s by Thursday, Friday morning, and then actually a lot of sunshine uh, once we shake free from the clouds tomorrow, Wednesday through Friday, good amount of sun. So it'll be more seasonal then? It will. Closer to average than below average by the weekend. All right. All right thanks, sounds Adam. Sounds good. So at this point last week, we were talking about a different kind of streak. for the Yes, Spurs. we were. Yes. Now this is the good kind. Yeah. And you know what? They were up by as many as 19 points tonight. They need every single one of those points yeah. to pull out this win tonight that went down on the last second. When we come back, the Spurs win streak continues without, without a lot of work at the end of this game and suspended without pay. The UT Longhorns coach who was arrested early this morning coming up. This essay salutes holiday greeting is brought to you by Gomez Law Firm. Hi, I'm Matt Powell, and on behalf of Jose Rios, Tony Garzavale, and everybody here at the Gomez Law Firm, we'd like to wish all of our military and veterans a happy holidays. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. After dropping 11 in a row, the Spurs have rebounded a bit and have won their last two. And tonight, they host a top three team in the East, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Isaiah Roby driving the baseline, pump fakes, puts it up and in for a five-point Spurs edge. Devin Vassell's shot is too hard off the glass, but Charles Bassey from St. Anthony High School slams it back down. It wasn't clean, but it counts. Spurs up 29-27 after one. Josh Richardson gives the Spurs a 10-point lead with a three from the wing. Spurs push the pace. Jeremy Sohan back after missing last five games. They head to Kelvin Johnson, the bucket and the foul. All that is part of a 16-0 run. In the Take the lead 65-49 at the break. The Cavs are able to cut that Spurs lead down to 10, but they don't fold here. Collins out to Kelton, who lines up for the straightaway three, drains it to push the Spurs lead to 18. Josh Richardson, the catch and shoot three from way beyond the arc. is good plus the foul. This is a four-point play. Gives the Spurs their largest lead of the night at 19. It'll be a one-point Spurs lead with 13 seconds to go. Cavs with the ball. Donovan Mitchell brings it up court. He gets it in the lane, but puts it up. But Kelton is there to swat it off the backboard. Cavs get the rebound. Darius Garland is wide open for a corner three, but it's off the mark. Cavs get another chance, and Mitchell grabs the board, but he throws it away, and Vassell scoops it up for a steal and to seal the win. Spurs have now won three in a row, 112 to 111. 
close games are, are always good for guys to either win or lose because they just teach you a lot about yourselves, about how the game goes, about the flow, about how you got to approach things. So, I mean, I think the experience that we got today was was big for us, and to come out with a win like that is is a big step. Oh yeah! Next up, the homestand continues. It's to be Wednesday at seven o'clock against Portland. Chris Beard has been suspended without pay by the University of Texas after men's head basketball coach was charged with felony family violence today. Beard was arrested early this morning after police were called in 1901 Vista Lane after a woman accused Beard of choking and biting her. He was booked into the Travis County Jail shortly after 4 p.m. And in fact, authorities released video of him in his prison uniform before he was released later this afternoon. Here's a statement released by the University tonight, shortly before the Longhorns game against Rice. The University of Texas statement in reads, in part, the university takes matters of interpersonal violence involved members of its community seriously given the information available the university has suspended chris beard from his position as head coach of the men's basketball team and will withhold his pay until further notice the utsa roadrunners trip to orlando for their bowl game started off on a very sad note that's when head football coach jeff trailer tweeted that his father passed away earlier this morning after a lengthy illness now as trailer said he will have the best seat in the house on friday with more on the roadrunners bowl preparations here's our larry ramirez in orlando yeah, thank you very much, Greg. The Roadrunners got to their team hotel around 3.30 this afternoon, Orlando time, and the first thing the players did, they all grabbed a whole pizza, which made them very happy. Tonight is all about having fun, but then tomorrow they return back to business. We've already practiced this morning. We did that before we left. Um, got on the plane, and yeah, I really haven't even looked at my schedule for the rest of the day. I know it's just a bunch of fun stuff, so. Tomorrow's more of a work day, meetings, practice, wake up. It's not, we try to keep it as normal as possible. And then uh, at 11, we've got some press conference stuff and haven't really looked past that. First and foremost, this is a business trip, but Coach Trailer knows bowl games are also meant to be fun. Uh, we, we've tried to be very intentional about that and reward these young men. Um, it's a, it's a fine line. It's a balance, but I know they're excited about each night's events. This is UTSA's fourth bowl game overall, and the second one, Coach Trailer will get to work from the field. Obviously, I didn't get to come to the first bowl because I had COVID, but so last year was my first bowl. Uh, so even though my children remind me that on Wikipedia I'm 0 and 3 in bowl games, I've only coached at one, so I don't understand how I'm 0 and 3. We got to talk to Mr. Wikipedia. <laughs> Hopefully, Mr. Wiki will soon be adding a victory to Coach Trailer's bowl record. Greg. Back to you. Thanks a lot, Larry. Former Texas Tech, now Mississippi State head football coach Mike Leach is fighting for his life tonight. They're suffering a massive heart attack at his home on Sunday. He was rushed to the hospital, then transferred by life flight to another treatment center where he's in critical condition. Back with more after this. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys assigned veteran wide receiver T.Y. Hilton after meeting with free agent Odell Beckham Jr., but it was during his physical the Cowboys discovered his surgically repaired knee would not be healed until mid or late January, so they went with Hilton. Former East Central Hornet, Baylor Bear, national champion, current WNBA star Alyssa Smith held a toy drive tonight at the Stan Bonowitz Center on the campus of East Central for her former Elof Elementary School in the Judson School District. The message I want to send is, you know, if you do have the opportunity to give something, then in your power, you should give it. And I always feel like we were put on this earth, you know, to give back to people. So that's what I'm doing here today. That is awesome. She'll deliver those gifts tomorrow, leading by example. Absolutely. Love that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. Tomorrow around noon, that's our high temperature, 77. Morning fog, drizzle, a few sprinkles, light showers through noon, and then I think we'll actually clear out a little bit. The rest of the work week, a decent amount of sunshine, but noticeably cooler jacket weather by Wednesday morning, and especially Thursday, Friday, when we're in the upper 30s, close to sunrise. And those high temperatures in the 60s until we get to the weekend, and it's even cooler, closer to 50, with some areas of light rain possible. You All said right. to keep those little jackets handy. Mm -hmm. You weren't kidding. Thank you. I think you said Jackie's. Keep the Jackie's happy. I did not say that. No, I think that's what Caskey said. Oh. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>